Valley Live and welcome to our Midweek Connection. I'm Sandy Valenzuela and our special guest for uh, Let's Connect today is Lupe Ogin. Did I say that right? Yes. Ogin? <laughs> I need to practice. <laughs> you said it right. <laughs> so Lupe, thank you for joining us. Okay. I'm so glad you're here. And so my first question for you is how long have you been attending Valley Life? I could say probably about three and a half years. Three and a half years. Yes. Okay. And how did you hear about Valley Life? Well, um, there was a pastor here before, and I thought to myself, okay, well, you know, I'll give it a try. So I did. And I was going to another church, which my nephew was a pastor. And I told my son one day, you know, like, you know, where am I going to go when, you know? And he goes, uh, Mom, there's one right across the street. And I thought, okay. And then at first I thought, nah, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to. But then a little voice told me, like, the devil was trying to tell me, you don't need to go to that church. And I thought, excuse me? Devil, you're a liar. I am going to another church. Either you like it or not. And I thought, I'm going to a church. And it was right across the, I live right across the street. So, you know, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go. So I came, that, you know, when the other pastor, then afterwards, my nephew resigned from being a pastor. That's when I thought, where am I going to go? Then I thought, okay. That's when I met Pastor Jesse. He is such a wonderful person. I love the way he speaks. He touches me every single time he preaches. That tears come down my eyes. <laughs> Wow. That yeah. Is awesome. Yes. That's so neat. Okay, so here's uh, the second question mm -hmm. that I have for you. Um, you have a very special testimony that some of us know, but mm -hmm. maybe quite a few don't know. Mm -hmm. And would you like to share that? Yes. Okay. Um, I was in a very bad accident, which it really. I really thought, you know, that God, God had took me away. Um, my best friend, which was, uh, we used to call her Ponchi, but her name was Frances Fernandez. And she wanted to go see the doctor, and I told her, well, what hospital do you want to go to? Uh, she goes, I don't want to go to Selma, they don't do nothing there. So we decided to go to Reedley. And we called a friend, she picked us up. And at that time, you know, I don't know what happened. I guess we were talking and stuff. And um, the friend of mine that was driving passed the stop sign on Zadar here in Dinuba. And I took more of the damage on my on the passenger side, which the whole door did. And Frances was in the back seat, and she goes, if I heard uh, somebody, the permit say, she's not responding, she's not responding. And I thought, oh no, she's gone. So then my friend said she wouldn't open the door and she goes, Lupi, are you okay? And I go, no. I go, I can't feel my jaw, I can't feel this. And when it hit, the car went like this. She took the stop sign, she took the pole and everything. Everything was on my side. But you know what, I thank God that I am here. You know, because I went through a lot. When I went into the hospital, they had said that they rushed me into, I was at, uh, Reedley, they rushed me. There was nothing they could do. They rushed me to, to Fresno Community. They went in there, took me into, and worked on my jaw, and they worked on my pelvis. And, and the thing is, you know, I did die. I did. When they were doing the operation, they had to use the, those paddles to bring me back. But they were there. I knew God wasn't ready for me. I was in a coma. People would come and see me. I didn't know who was there. I know there was a lot of people here out here praying. My family. There was a bunch of people in the in the in the what do you call it? The, in the waiting room. People praying and praying and praying. Mm -hmm. And when I woke up, I saw people. I tried to I tried to talk, but I couldn't talk because I had a tube going down my my throat. And. Um, they were just, you know, tremendously praying for me, and I knew that he was praying for me. Pastor um, 
uh, living sister um, Martha. Martha Witt, Pastor Witt, and and you know it is like you know and this is the most thing I saw was I was walking down the hallway and like I saw a bunch of angels all around me and then I thought okay I'm walking down I see somebody in a white garment didn't see his face but there was angels around him and I thought that's Jesus and he goes go back I don't need you right now you have a lot of things out there to do for me you know so you know but I'm glad I thank God that I'm here Praise you God. know I'm a walking miracle I've been through one yes. accident before my arm then this one you know what I tell I thank God every single day because I'm a walking miracle amen I never thought I was gonna walk ever again but when I was in rehab I told the devil trying to tell me oh you're not gonna get out of here you know what devil you have something else coming I walk out of the out of out of the rehab. My son's out there, videotaping me, and he goes, "Mom, you're walking." And I told him, "You think the devil's gonna keep me down, huh? Uh, -uh. <laughs> the devil's not. The devil's a liar. The devil's not gonna keep your mama down." Amen. You know, so, That's awesome. And I just Praise thank God. God for everything He's done. I I thank God for this church, for the loving people here. Yes. Because you know what? To me, you know what? I won't go nowhere else. This is my church. Praise God. This is my church, and I love everybody here. You know, especially you, sister. When you <laughs> tell me, Mrs. Loopy, Mrs. Loopy, that makes me feel like, that makes me feel, you know, precious. You know, you telling me that. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody has ever said that. You know, and, you know, sometimes, you know, I still, you know, my, I went to the doctor, and they said I have a blockage in my heart. And I think that's from the accident. So I need to, you know, I went and now they have to do another test. So I have to go to the hospital and they're going to do, I don't know what the test is, but there is a blockage in my heart since the accident. I've been stressed out because I lost a good friend of mine, right. you know, and, but you know what? I know, I thank God that, you know what? She's somewhere where she belongs. It's just a miracle. I'm here, you know. Yes. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> wow. Yes. And you've got yes. that beautiful testimony to yes. tell people, whoever you meet, yes, who yes, maybe yes. they're discouraged about their healing. Yes, yes. And you can pray for them with yes, authority yes. and you can share the miracle that yes. God has performed in your yes, life yes. and encourage people. Yes, yes. So that is awesome. What a beautiful yes. thing. Uh, Brother Fidencio said, he goes, once all this stuff goes away, Lupe, you know, we get together, I guess, over at the, at the Salazar Center. He goes, I would love for you to give your testimony there mm -hmm. yes. and tell the people that would what you went through and what God did to you. And I go, I will. I will. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and God knew he could rely on you yes, to do yes, that. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. Wonderful. Um, and so, how can we be praying for you, Lupe? Uh, well, just be praying for me for that, for this blockage I have, that God will just remove it. Yes. That I won't have to go through any kind of surgery, you know, and stuff like that. Because you know what? God has been good to me. And I know there is nothing, nothing so safe. There's nothing wrong with me. Yes. You know, yeah, Amen. God is, you know. Yes. I, I rebuke all this in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, <laughs> I agree with you, sister. That's right. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. Like I always say, God is good. He never leaves us or forsakes us. Because he, right. he, he never left me. He never left me. Mm -hmm. He's been there for me. That's right. And he will always be there for me. That's right. You know? Yeah. And to my, my family, you know, they've been going through a lot too. Mm -hmm. You know? Me, my family and stuff, okay. you know? You know, especially my son, keep him in prayer because he's just right now at work. He, he is a, a, what do you call it, assistant manager for Toyota. Mm -hmm. And he's just, it's a real hard, hard work for him. And he's just been stressed out. Mm -hmm. I ask him every day, son, are you okay? He goes, mom. He goes, you know what? I just so stressed out, you know. Yeah. And then I tell him, I pray for you. I'll pray for you. And, 
-hmm. And even when he doesn't come to church, I tell pastor, you know, pastor, can you pray for Isaac? He goes, I sure will. And he, every time we're going, he tells everybody, this is a walking miracle. <laughs> <laughs> It's so true. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. So we're going to be praying for your son. Okay. It's Isaiah, Isaac. correct? Isaac. Isaac. Yes. Okay. Yes. For Isaac and for the heart thing. Mm -hmm. And we're just believing with you, sister. Yes. That it's all good. Oh, yeah. God is not done with you oh, yet. Oh, no, he's not. No, he's, he's not. not done with he's you not yet. done with me yet. <laughs> oh. oh, thank you so much for joining us. You're thank welcome you for so much. sharing such a special yes. testimony. Yes. And I know. People have been inspired yes. and encouraged yes. because God is a God of healing. Yes, He's he still is. healing. Whoa, yes, and yes. if anyone's told you that's not true for today, yes. that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. Yeah. God is our, yes. our healing God, a yes, delivering God. Yes. And we have our we have proof. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, so, yes, yes. So thank you, uh, Valley Life, for joining us today. And we will see you next time on Let's Connect. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>
principles or uses of salt. There's many uses as far as that goes, and uh, we use it in our daily lives. Uh, but it has three main qualities or purposes that we can use it for. Number one is salt is a seasoning. And when we think about this, if you use salt in your foods, which I'm sure most all of you do, uh, it brings flavor, it brings out the flavor in the foods that you eat. I know there's some people that aren't allowed to eat any kind of salt or uh, maybe not allowed, but their doctor has advised them that they should remain from using salt in their diet. I remember my aunt and uncle back in Kentucky years ago, uh, they were talking about um, the salt that they had in their diet and they had to completely eradicate it from their their diet altogether. Uh, they took it, they looked at the, the ingredients on everything that they bought um, and checked to see if it had any salt in it. If it didn't, they wouldn't get it. Uh, they didn't have any salt in their cabinet. They didn't, uh, they got rid of all the salt. Uh, kind of reminds me of the children of Israel when they were delivered out of Egypt. If you remember, they had to go so quickly out of Egypt, they didn't even have time to prepare their meals and their bread with the leavening or the salt to give it rise and to give it flavor. So they basically ate unleavened bread the night of Passover. And so um, my aunt and uncle were sharing this about how that they weren't allowed to or couldn't eat any salt because of health conditions. And so they went on for this for a long time. I'm not even sure how long. But then one day they decided, you know what, let's just have a bologna sandwich. And so they grabbed a, a package of bologna. They made a bologna sandwich and they bit into that. And they said it was so salty that they could not even bear to eat it because their body had been, become accustomed to eating everything without salt. And so the, the salt was just overpowering and they weren't able to eat it at all. And they ended up having to throw it away because they, it was unedible for them. And when, uh, when we start cooking, you know, I've tried to cook without salt before or at the wrong moments. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to cook beans before I tried once, <laughs> and it was pretty much a disaster. Um, I started boiling the beans and just, you know, going away, going away, and, and uh, Maggie, my wife, came in, and she said, oh, uh, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm making beans. And she said, oh, did you put salt in it? I said, um, not yet. I was going to, but I'm waiting for later. And she said, you better put it right now. So uh, I said, okay. So I put some salt in, you know, not a whole lot, just a little bit. And uh, so finally we made the beans. And uh, so we uh, went, sat down to eat them that night with our dinner and we bit into them and, and tasted them. And they were just so bland. I mean, had no flavor at all. And it was difficult for us to eat those beans because there was no flavor in them. Um, salt is something, and, and all kinds of seasonings that we use, is something that we use to season our foods. Uh, if you can imagine, you know, mashed potatoes and gravy, or beans, refried beans, or frijol, frijoles, <laughs> as you would say in Spanish, but the, um, the flavors that it brings out, it, the salt has that property and that capability of bringing out the flavor in those foods that we eat. And without it, the foods just taste bland and don't have any flavor at all. Unless, of course, you are used to not having salt in your diet, as my aunt and uncle were. But when we relate this to the Christian life, if salt is a seasoning, well, what is the salt in our lives? That how, how do we become salt in the way of being a seasoning in this world? Well, I kind of considered this, and, you know, I thought of some things that we bring into this world through our Christian faith 
that is a seasoning for this world that we live in. For true Christians that live a godly life and live according to God's plan and are in the word and are in prayer and really serving God with a full heart, then the properties of salt or the seasoning that we provide are evident in our daily lives. One of the things that we might consider to be a seasoning to this world is the joy that we have. Mm -hmm. You see, joy is something that is, it's not happiness. It, it's, it is happiness, but it's more than that. Joy is not something that you get when you go to Disneyland and you ride the rides, or when you go to the beach and you're surfing on a surfboard, or you're just enjoying the sunset and enjoying the waves and watching the whales and watching people just have a good time and, and enjoying maybe having a barbecue on the beach. And the feeling that you get of being together with your family and just having a good time. Going up to the mountains and staying in a cabin when there's snow out on the ground. I, I don't know about you, but that to me is one of my idealistic things to, um, to do is uh, to just be in a place where there's snow on the ground, like two or three foot thick or deep, and just look out and see all the beautiful white covering the whole ground. And then you're inside, you're up right close to a fireplace, just staying warm and cozy with your family, um, maybe playing board games, maybe just talking, maybe just, you know, having a good time together. And, you know, those times that we have and those things that we do, they're fun and they're exciting. But after it's all over with, and after we go home from those places and come back home, oh boy, it's Monday morning again, and I gotta start back to work. What happens to that feeling of joy or happiness and fun and good times? It's like it almost didn't even happen. But you see, with joy, what happens is it's something that something that is rooted down in your soul. It's something that the Holy Spirit gives us, that it's just the joy of living and the joy of life and the hope for a future, something that we have that, that just exists inside us. And that's why some people that are Christians, when people talk to them, they're like, I don't know what it is about you, but there's something that just attracts me to you, something that, um, that you have that I wish I had. And it's that joy that we have inside because it's not something that is passive. It's not something that is temporary. It's something that continually flows out of our lives. Like Jesus said to the woman at the well, springs of living water that where you will never thirst again and it just continually flows from our lives mm -hmm. even in the difficult times in fact sometimes more so in the difficult times that joy just exudes from our uh, from our presence or our being because uh, we want to share it with someone else and they see that in us another property of or uh, a way that we are seasoning the world is through our peace. We just have peace in knowing that God is with us and that we're serving God and that we're living for Him. And peace, again, is not something that... Um, <laughs> do I dare go there? <laughs> it's not a treaty that you sign like they have just signed in Israel. And uh, just a side note, uh, it's exciting to me to see what's taking place in Israel today and the signing of that peace treaty and uh, between them and the United Arab Emirates. And I, I apologize, I know I should know this, but uh, they signed a peace treaty with, um, with uh, three different people. The United States, for one, I guess, was involved with it. But... It just um, is something else because I believe in Israel and the future of Israel and what's taking place there today. 
And I am so thankful that the times are moving toward that direction. Uh, it kind of goes along with um, a little bit of, I guess, um, worry for some people. Um, I would call it a sign of the end times. And it's not to scare you or make you afraid because we as Christians, we have hope in the future. We have hope in what's to come. We have hope that when Jesus steps back on the Mount of Olives, that we are going to go up in the clouds to meet him in the air, that, that the rapture is going to take place and, and we're going to be with Jesus and we're going to be in heaven. We're going to be in eternity forever. But, um, but a, the Bible talks about when they cry out peace and safety, then sudden destru destruction shall come upon them. And it's a, it's a sign of the end times. And, but the truth is that I, I am so excited because this is happening. That means that, that things are falling into place biblically. Uh, but anyway, let's move on uh, off of that side note. Um, just a thought for you to think on and, and may God bless you. But, but the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, as it says in Philippians 4, 7. That it's that peace that we're just content, we're satisfied, we, we have no need of anything. Like David said in the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That means that he has no want, he has no need, he has need of nothing else because he's content in his relationship with his God. And he is there, he has peace with God, and he knows and has that assurance and that assurity that he is in the presence and the peace of God. But the peace is something that is settled in, in our hearts and in our minds. You know, when you talk to a lot of people, um, they struggle with sleep at night. And they struggle with... Um, being at peace. They, they are worried about things. They are troubled about so many things, especially today. I mean, look all around us. In the United States of America, there is such unrest and such turmoil that's taking place like we have never seen in our lifetimes. It's possibly happened in the past. I know, I, I, I got to tell you, I would go back to the days of the um, division in America during the Civil War. Um, it's almost come to that point, and God forbid that, that it would ever go that far. But there's a lot of unrest and a, a lot of um, disagreements and conflict in our country today over what's right and what's wrong and whose, whose way is correct and whose way is not correct. But you see, even in the midst of all this, we have peace. And I got to tell you, me and my wife, we can go to bed and we can sleep at night. I mean, we have no trouble with that. Because there's peace in our hearts. We're not troubled about these things. We're not worried about these things. We're, we're joyous and thrilled that God is part of our lives and that we're able to, to accomplish His will and His purpose, whatever it may be for us. One more thing that is a seasoning as we as Christians, and that's something that has so much misunderstanding. It's a word that's so misunderstood by the world today, and that word is love. You see, we have a love that is beyond anything this world can understand or comprehend, because it's the love of God. It's called agape love. An agape kind of love is an unconditional love. It's where you love people, not because of what status they hold, not because of how much money they have, not because of um, how pretty they are or how handsome they are, not because of um, what they can provide to you. You see, love is something that you give or that you have for someone because it's, it's an out, outward expression of what's already taken place on the inside. And... That's why it's so exciting for Christians. Uh, th um, this coming Saturday, in fact, uh, we are getting ready to do a 
a ministry of food outreach to the city of Selma. And we're so excited about this. We've been, our church has been doing it for quite a while. But, um, but it's something that we do to the commu for the community out of love. We don't expect anything back from them. We don't expect them to give to the church or, or even give for the groceries that we provide to them. It's because of love that we give to them. And some of them, maybe they have money. Maybe they don't. Maybe they, they live in a nice community and they, they're able to get their own groceries. Maybe they're not. But the truth is that we want to do it because we want to show an expression of our love toward them. And maybe by that, they will see the true love of Christ and they will give their heart to Jesus and turn their lives over to Him. So, um, but the ultimate purpose is just loving them and showing them. So, those are some areas where we, can, we have seasoning. The second property of salt is that salt has healing properties. And uh, you know that um, we, uh, we use salt a lot in, uh, in medicines and medicinal purposes. It can heal wounds. It heals mouth sores. It heals cuts. Of course, uh, I don't know that you'd want to put salt directly into a cut <laughs> because that would sting pretty bad. Um, I, I've done it or used, I don't know about uh, salt, but I've used alcohol and, and uh, it stings quite a bit. Um, and salt does that, but uh, of course you can use hydrogen peroxide too, which is another alternative. But if you look, um, you can go on the internet. There are so many of those life hacks that you can find about what salt can be used for and different purposes that it has. Uh, but salt it has healing properties. And we as Christians are the healing property for the world that we live in through the power of the Holy Ghost and by the um, by the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives and by the by the power of God Almighty we have healing that we can provide it or that we can express uh, by God's Spirit and uh, we bring healing um, look at all the prophets or the uh, the healing ministers down through the ages that we have seen um, I could go we, well we could go all the way back to the New Testament and Peter and Paul and uh, Silas and all of those people that uh, those uh, prophets and the the, uh, the apostles that went out and they healed people they saw people raised from the dead they uh, did all kinds of miracles and signs and wonders because of the healing uh, that they were able to utilize by the power of God. And so we can bring healing in that way. We can bring healing spiritually and emotionally by the words that we speak. Just I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting down with someone and they were going through something and, and I just began to share with them, you know, my heart and how I felt about their situation and they then they went away and they were like thank you so much I don't know what I would have done without you sharing with me and sometimes I've needed that healing word uh, word as well for my for my emotional well-being I guess there there's been times that I've gone through situations and I've needed someone to sit there and to help me through a situation. And so we can have emotional healing and, and um, for, our, uh, for our mind and for our wellness, our emotional wellness as well. And uh, also, of course, for our soul, because the blood of Jesus Christ can save us from all sins. He can heal our soul. He can heal us of those sins in our lives. He can heal us of that that cancerous uh, disease that is spreading in our lives, in our soul, because He can cleanse us by His precious blood and deliver us from the sickness and the disease of sin. I know a lot of people today, um, 
they're like, Dwayne, I, I, I don't need to deal with any sin. I don't, I don't need anything to save me from my sin. I don't need saving. But the truth is that we all need saving because we're all born into, into sin. The problem is that many of us have seared our conscience by doing the same thing over and over and over. At first, when we started doing it, maybe it didn't seem like it, or maybe it really bothered us and it really was overwhelmed us. And we're like, oh, man, I feel bad about it. What if I get caught? What if somebody knows that I did that? But then the more and more we do it, each time it gets easier and easier until our, our conscience is seared and then we don't think about it anymore. We're hardened. Our heart is calloused. But the truth is that Jesus Christ loves you more than you can ever know. And he wants to come into your life and he wants to show you a better way how you can have that joy and peace and love in your life like you've never experienced it before. Um, you know that the healing properties of salt, it might take a little bit of time. It, like I mentioned earlier, when you first put it on, it's going to sting a little bit. It's going to hurt. But if you keep dressing it and putting the, um, the ointment on it continuously over and over, then eventually it will heal those wounds. So if you have been hurt, maybe you've been hurt physically, mentally, or in some other way, God can help you and heal those wounds in your lives. And we as Christians should attempt to do the same by the power of Jesus Christ. So the third thing that we come to, salt is a preservative. And i got to tell you right now, that in America, there are a lot of people that are trying to do away with the church, do away with religion, and do away with any kind of gospel message at all. Because they are so immune to the truth that they don't want to hear about it. And they think that we are uh, very... Oh, uh, aggressive about our faith, and maybe we are in some ways, but we're not aggress as aggressive about our faith as a lot of people are about the issues that they are passionate about. And maybe we should be, as far as that goes. But the truth is, if those people in America and throughout the world were able to somehow take out the Christians from all of society, then there would be utter chaos and, and utter um, confusion and a lot of uh, ungodliness that would be taking place because then their conscience would be removed. It would be like the conscience of the world would be removed or the, conscien the conscience of the United States would be removed because taking out the Christian you're basically eliminating any reason to have any guidelines or any rules. Then everything is, is okay. It's not, it's not what according to what the Bible says. It's according to what Dwayne Lee says. And whatever I want, that's what goes. It doesn't matter about anybody else. And so what the world doesn't realize is that if they were to take the Christian out, we would not be preserving the world anymore. We are a preservative. We are keeping this world from the wrath of God. We're protecting it. We're saving it. We're keeping it. Um, back in the uh, olden days, I guess, when um, people, when men would cross the, the oceans in their ships and they would go for you know months on end, because if they tried to travel from one continent to another, then they'd have to go for a long, long time. And so they had to take their provisions with them. When they did, they eventually, those provisions would spoil, especially if they took any kind of meats or possibly vegetables or what have you. So what they would do is would, they would take these big barrels uh, 
and they would put the meat down in the barrels and then they would fill it with salt. And they'd put more meat in and filled it with salt. Put more meat in and filled it with salt. Why? Because salt was a preservative. And after they would be traveling for, for a month or so, then that meat would be protected by the salt and it would preserve that meat. So if we compare that to the Christian life, we are pres a preservative for this world. And we are here so that we can keep this world from God's wrath and keep him from just coming down. You don't believe me? Look at the Old Testament in the book, in the days of Noah. God looked down on the earth and he saw the condition of man and how everybody did what was right in their own eyes. They didn't care about um, Sally or Sam or Jack or Jill or anybody else. It was number one. What's in it for me? What, do, what can I get out of this? What can I do to make my life better? And that's basically the thinking of the world today. But you see, the thinking of the Christian is exactly the opposite. Because it's not, what can I get out of this? What can I accomplish from this? What can I gain out of this situation? It's, what can I do to help those who are in need? Salt is a preservative. Uh, Tommy Tenney wrote a book called God Chasers several years ago. And he said that um, he was asked the question, why is God not moving in our church? Why, why are people falling away from the church? Why don't we have bigger attendance and bigger churches and people flocking to the churches? He basically said it's because there's no bread in the house of God. He says crumbs in the carpet and empty shelves. There's got to be more. He said that, um, that when there's bread in the house, then people come to the church, they flock to the church, they see the, the power of God. He talked about a service that he was in. And when people would come to, there was actually a revival meeting, and when people came into the church building, they could feel the presence of God as soon as they walked in the doors. Some of them couldn't even make it past, uh, out of the lobby into the sanctuary before they fell to their knees and cried out to God for mercy on their souls because they felt the presence and the power of God so real and so great. Um, at the time of this recording, um, it was just this past Sunday that our pastor gave us a homework assignment. And it was the assignment of watching a video by David Wilkerson. It was called a call to anguish. And from the very moment that that video started, my wife and I were sitting down watching it. I could feel the urgency and the passion of the Holy Spirit and of David Wilkerson as he shared with us those thoughts about the call to anguish. If you haven't seen it yet, I challenge you I implore you to go watch that video. It will change you. If it doesn't, then you really need to get down and pray because he had a message that really struck the heart, it struck my heart, and I imagine struck many hearts. And the people in his church, you could see Times Square Church and um, thousands of people that, that attended there. And he poured out his heart it, with, with humility and really just um, sorrow that he had to sh even share the message. But he spoke out of his heart and spoke the truth. I, I mean, it was almost impossible not to hang on to every word that he spoke because of the, the message that he gave and the words that he spoke. And basically saying that we need to get down on our knees in prayer. We need to cry out to God. We need to call out to God and pray fervently and feverishly and tenaciously and hold on to the Word of God and come and break, keep praying and praying until we break through to God's presence and have Him break our heart and bring us to a place of humility and repentance before God. 
And if we did, I truly believe that we would be a preservative for this world. And I thank God for that. We, our pastor, ever since he's been the pastor here at the church, he has emphasized the uh, importance of prayer and the need for prayer in our lives. He has practiced it in our church and in our services and taught us to pray and uh, has challenged us to pray even in the services and taken time out for us to spend time in prayer and, uh, and implored us and challenged us and, and asked us to in, endeavor in praying. And if we did, we would do that. Um, Nadar Pagambri, who spoke a few weeks ago, he shared with us how prayer is an important element of the Christian life and we must get on our knees and pray. I, I must confess to you that um, I, my prayer life is not up to where it should be right now. I, I do pray, but I remember a time in my life when I was passionate for God. I was a youth pastor of a little tiny church that my dad pastored in southwestern Oklahoma. And, um, and I felt the, the burden and the, um, the need for the presence of God in my life to do the work that he wanted me to do there. And I just cried out to God and I got before God and I spent hours and hours in prayer because I knew that I needed help from God. I couldn't do it on my own. And there was one time when I was in my dad's office alone. And I began to pray, and I just was there kneeling before God. And I could feel his presence. I knew he was in that room with me. And I didn't feel con condemnation or judgment or him pointing a finger at me. But what I felt was an overwhelming, overpowering love that just flooded the room and flooded my heart and flooded my mind and my soul. And I could feel the presence of God, and I knew he was there with me. And, and David Wilkerson talked about this in the video the other day. Of course, the, the recording was done eight years ago. He's, he's passed on to be with the Lord now. But um, he shared how that when you really get to the place of anguish in your heart and in your soul with God, then the fruits of that will, will become enlightened in your life and will become revealed in your life. And you'll have those things, like we talked about earlier, the, the joy, the love, and the peace. And you can have that in your life. Another thing about joy that I just wanted to touch on. If you look at the word joy, J-O-Y, what brings so much pleasure in that is because that it represents, it's kind of like an um, anacrostic, anagram. <laughs> uh, but J is for Jesus. And O is for others, and Y is for you. Because if you put Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between, then that makes all the difference in the world. And when we do that, then that joy and that peace and that love come out in our lives and in our hearts. So let's just close in a word of prayer right now. And uh, I just trust that you've got something out of this message that will touch you and that will draw you closer to God. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for the word that you have given me to share with your people. And I pray that you would move in the hearts and lives of everyone that hears this message that I am preaching. And I pray that you would grip their hearts with your love and your compassion and your mercy. Lord, that you would just help them and bring them to a place of repentance and salvation, that they can cry out to you and call out to you in anguish and in pain for their condition and for their soul, and that you would just fill their hearts with love and joy and peace right now, that you would make this word become alive in their hearts and that they would become the salt of the earth to be a preservative and to be a seasoning and to be healing for this lost and dying world. I just thank you, Lord, because you are so wonderful. You are so magnificent, and you are so loving and kind and merciful. I just give you all the praise and the glory and the honor, and thank you for all that you're doing this very moment in the lives of these people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. God bless you.
BERDUA